مختل سے آ رہی ہے صدا میں یتیم ہوں جو ہے وہ ظلم ڈھاتا ہے مج بور جان کر جو ہے وہ ظلم ڈھاتا ہے مج بور جان کر شاید یہی ہے میری خطا میں یتیم ہوں باد حسین کس نے کہا میں یتیم ہوں سر رکھ دیا سکینہ نے زینب کی گود میں سر رکھ دیا سکینہ نے زینب کی گود میں کیجے پھوپی خیال میرا میں یتیم ہوں باد حسین کس نے کہا میں یتیم ہوں میں اپنے آسو سے بجھا لوں گی اپنی پیاس میں اپنے آسو سے بجھا لوں گی اپنی پیاس دریا سے لاٹ آؤ چچا میں یتیم ہوں باد حسین کس نے کہا میں یتیم ہوں بولی سکینہ شمر سے کا نو پر کے ہاں بولی سکینہ شمر سے کا نو پر کے ہاں گاہی نہ چین بہرے خدا میں یتیم ہوں باد حسین کس نے کہا میں یتیم ہوں مختل سے آ رہی ہے صدا میں یتیم ہوں سلوات
बोली मां क्या हुआ सकीना को गशिए क्यों आ गया गशिए क्यों आ गया सकीना को क्यों ये खामोश हो गई आखिर किसने क्या कह दिया किसने क्या कह दिया सकीना को क्या खबर इसको क्या हुआ बेटा देखो आप जरा सकीना को देखो बेदर सकीना को ना शिकायत है अब तमाचो की नारसन का गिला सन का गिला सकीना को क्या जब दागे बेकसी न सकीना उठा सकी और दर्दे दिल न खौफ के मारे सुना सकी खाए तमाचे शिमर के जब तक खा सकी सिंकम तदुक बहुत सिंकम तदुक बहुत जफाबे शुमार की आकर ये जबर दे आकर ये जबर दे के गर की तो शिमर पुकारा खमोश हो और चुप हुई तो बेपिदरी ने कहा कि रो गए शिदत अतश से पुकारी के पानी दो गया करके रह गई बाबा की गया करके रह गई बाबा की सोई जो आंसू पहुंच के चश्मे पुराप से है हुसैन कह के बेरोट बैठी है है हुसैन कह के बेरोट बैठी पाप से जब प्यास लगती रोके चचा को पुकार थी दुखते जो कान शाह हुदा को पुकारती आता न जब कोई तो खुदा को पुकारती जीने से तंग हो के खुदा को पुकार जीने से तंग हो के खुदा को पुकार कहे ती थी ने चचाना इमामे उमम रहे रुलवाने को अधूरे रोने को रुलवाने को अधूरे रोने को जिंदा से कह 
کہتی تھی یہ کبھی وہ اسیر غام ہو جائے گا کل ایک تیرا
looked down upon by other people and say, what's wrong with you? But it's in the heart and it's inside. Such resentments, if they are kept inside, then they are going to just grow in there. And they grow until you become cynical, negative. And even when something comes to you that is so clear and beautiful and pleasant, like Imam Hussein, you will have a negative attitude towards him. Yes. Why? Because so much resent, so much things you have kept inside of you, you never were able to take it out. And this is what, where people, for example, who met Imam Hussein, and I've read Imam Hussein was a very pleasant person, very friendly. People loved him. You know, anyone who he used to meet in any company and any gathering, people will be attracted to the sweet personality that he had. Then why is it that people seeing such a person, being called by such a person, a lot of them just had rancor in their hearts of always being complaining and never enjoying the blessings that Allah has given them. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now how do we bring out these feelings? And obviously there's a long way that I have to go today, so I'm going to go there as fast as I can. So I do just plead with you to keep up with me as we go forward now, because I'm trying to put a lot in a uh, restricted space over here. And uh, so inshallah, you know, let's uh, you know, get some help uh, of truly understanding faster with a loud salawat. Oh. You know, uh, and obviously, you know, whenever you see a Maulana sending a salawat, it's not because he needs a break or he wants to drink some water. Really, uh, my friends, the teachings of Ahlul Bayt are beautiful at the same time, sometimes deep and complex. Wow, I need to enjoy the blessings that Allah has given me. Really enjoy it. Take the time right now. All the blessings, my friends. People, really, Allah has given them blessings that they could enjoy. They live their whole life ignoring those blessings. <laughs> ignoring those blessings. And then at the end, they're only left with regrets. How many people have lived their lives had a whole family and children and you saw the children growing in your house but you never took the time to enjoy them. You never took the time to enjoy them. At the end when they're all grown up and now you know at one time your child used to come after you wanting you to spend time with him and then after 18 years you're running after the child you know, so you can spend some time with him and he's running away. <laughs> you know, if you had only taken the time to build that relationship, to, to, to enjoy that blessing Allah has given you, maybe then you would have given a little more thanks to Allah for this blessing. You see, this is what happens. We let go of these blessings Allah is giving us. He's giving us toys that we can enjoy. And we, I don't know for what reason, because of the false understanding of a religion that has been taught to us, that we say that, no, we should not be enjoying, lazat is not for believers, you know, and so on and so forth, they go on like that. So my friends, first thing to understand is lazat and pleasure and enjoyment and fun is in our nature. That's how Allah programmed us. He programmed, we cannot take it out, nor can we suppress it. The more we try to take it out, the more we try to suppress it, it only hurts us, and it only destroys our own personality and character. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad.
So that's what we had learned the last two days. Now let me just go forward with that. So now my friends, if Allah has created us with this inclination of wanting pleasure, seeking pleasure, enjoyment, then obviously he must have made a way for us to take this inclination, take this natural instinct that we have within ourselves to the highest level. How do I take it to the highest level? I mean, I am created to enjoy, so I want to enjoy more naturally. So Allah, what did you do? And how did you make the path by which I can enjoy more? Because usually, for example, what happens is that when you're given a toy, you can only play so much with a toy, right? And after that, you get bored. You know, all of you have bought toys for your children. You know that how fast that goes into the toy chest? I, and it goes there and it, doesn't ever, it never comes back from there. And then the only time it gets out of your house is through a garage sale. And then you think that I bought that for you for your fifth birthday or your sixth birthday and you just let it go after two weeks. That's what I'm, well, okay. Then you got a new gift for him. And Allah does that. Gives a gift, wants you to enjoy, you get bored of that, gives you another gift. He's always giving you a gift, my friend. Every breath is a gift. Every breath is a gift that you have. Every day is a gift when you wake up. Allah is saying, did you enjoy yesterday? Here, here's another day. Here's another day. Go ahead, enjoy. Right? This is how He's dealing with us. And here we are, <laughs> another day. <laughs> You have to go through a whole another day now. <laughs> Allah is saying, I gave it to you to enjoy. Why are you you're throwing it in the trash can like that? Don't do that with the blessings. You know, enjoy it. Allah wanted you to enjoy because it's beautiful. Allah's blessings are beautiful. And He gives it to us. So first, Allah knows that we want to enjoy because that's in our nature. And if we want to enjoy in our nature, then Allah must have made a path for us by which we can enjoy and reach the heights of pleasure. How did He do it? Well, here's one way that we, in, by which Allah made it possible for us. What is that? My friends, pleasures, lazat, pleasures are divided into two types. There are pleasures that are actually readily available for you. And then there are pleasures that are potentially available for you. There are two types of pleasures that you have in your life. I'm not saying this is the Islamic ideology. <laughs> I'm not talking about some ideology or philosophy here. I'm talking about you. You have two types of pleasures that you feel and experience in your life. One are the pleasures that are readily available for you that you feel without having to do any work or any search, you, Allah has given them and they are ready to use right away. And the second type of pleasures are potential pleasures that are not really available for you. You have to do a little bit of work for it. You know, make some sacrifices for it, right? Two types of pleasure. Let me explain that. The first type of pleasure that are readily available for you, like eating. You know, when you're hungry, you eat. Eating is pleasurable. How many of you eat to stay alive? <laughs> you know, I'm staying so I can stay alive. You know, I'm eating so I can stay alive. Uh, how many of you do that? Or do you enjoy your food? <laughs> Just admit it. Don't be too pious, you know. <laughs> Just admit that I enjoy my food. I really enjoy my food, you know, I, and that's why, for example, I don't eat broccoli or bacon, you know. <laughs> you know, I'd rather go for the potatoes and <laughs> the beef, the red meat. But anyway, what happens is that you, when you approach food, you enjoy it. There's nothing wrong with that. And you know what? When you're eating, eating is pleasurable. Now, did you go to a school and learn? how to enjoy eating? No, you didn't. For example, sleeping. You know, we sleep and it's pleasurable. We like sleeping. You know, I mean, really, we like sleeping so much that it 
manifests itself in so many ways. Even when we put the alarm on, you know, when you put the alarm on, if you notice, the snooze button is the biggest button. <laughs> Sleeping, you know, it's pleasurable and we like to sleep. So what happens is that these are things, you know, that we enjoy. Now, we never went to college to learn about how to sleep well, you know, how to enjoy your sleep. We don't need a course for that. We sleep, you know, and we like it. And we take pleasure from it. And these are pleasures that Allah has given to us where we don't need to train ourselves or we don't need to go to school to learn about it or have any sort of special course for it. These are available for you and you enjoy it in your life. You take advantage of it. We all do. We all do that. Now there are certain pleasures that are not readily available for you. They have a pleasure. But it's not ready. You got to work a little bit more for that. You got to do some search for that, some thinking for that, or whatever it takes. For example, knowing Allah. Knowing Allah is not like readily available for everyone. If it was, then everyone else in the world would be enjoying it. Right? If it was natural for a human being, then everyone would be enjoying it. But because it's not readily available, it's potentially, I need to do a little bit of thinking here. A little bit of deduction here. And if I reach that, then there's a pleasure in it. There's a pleasure in it. And so much pleasure that those who have reached there have said, meaning Ahlul Bayt, when they reached there, they said that we find pleasure in the difficulty and hardship of in hardship so much that people do not find in their ease and comfort you're looking the you know like we love comfort and we there's a pleasure in that imam is saying that the difficulty for allah is more pleasurable than that comfort that you find pleasure in. Now look at that. So obviously there, you know, wow, that's a pleasure, but it's not just attainable right away. There's a little bit of work that has to be done for that, right? So there are two types of pleasures, my friend. One is things that is readily available for us, one that is potentially available for us. Let me now see if these are two types of pleasure and those who have reached that pleasure have testified that that is more pleasurable than this. And now we haven't been there to even judge. Right? We haven't been there to judge. But those who have been there, they told us, not, not just they told us, right? Now, Imam is not just saying that. Imam is showing that in his life. Look at Imam Ali alayhi salam. Now, you know, when Allah tells us to pray, you know, we pray. Alhamdulillah, we are believers. We go, we pray, and our, our, after prayer is done, you know, Allah asks us to make a dua. We'll make that dua. It's formality that we are done with, and right away it's over. Right? We go away. When, when we saw Imam Ali praying, you know, we saw someone who was so attached to prayer that... Nothing would take him away from that. You literally had to pry him out of the prayer mat. That's how much he's attached to his prayer mat. Oh, Mom, what are you getting out of this? You see, what kind of pleasure are you feeling that I'm not feeling? And that pleasure that you're feeling obviously is a lot more because you went through what I went through, which is sleep and eat and food and all these things. I felt that pleasure, but now the pleasure that you're feeling is so immense and so great that when I look at you, I want that. I want what you're feeling. You saw the pleasure in them, right? So now my friends, that cannot be gained right away. There's some work that needs to be done towards that. There's something that needs to be done towards that, those potential pleasures. And I'll explain. It's not just in prayers in Islam. You know, I, I don't, want, don't want to give that image right now. 
It's in everything that you do, my friends. Everything that you do in life, there are certain pleasures Allah has kept available for you. There are certain pleasures Allah has kept for you if you strive for it. For example, you know, for an 18-year-old or a 17-year-old, the highlight of his life is that he gets a job at Dunkin' Donuts. You know, I mean, Dunkin' Donuts is like, you know, I got a job, Dad. I got a job, Dad. You know, what do you do? What do you do? You know, I make donuts. Or flipping burgers. You know? You know, it's like, for example, this is it for him, right? You look at him, he's like, this is it. Now, you looking at that and say, I hope, you know, I mean, what else do you want to do in life? I mean, at that stage, he says, you know, if I can be the best <laughs> burger flipper, you know, and the donut maker, I, you know, <laughs> I've achieved it. Now, obviously, you'll look at your chance and son, I didn't raise you to be like this, right? <laughs> have a little bit higher hopes than that, <laughs> you know? But that's the highlight of his life. Now, for example, how much do you earn? Now, when he gets his first paycheck, you know, where he's earning like minimum wage, I don't know what the minimum wage is here, right? Uh, you know, seven, eight dollars, nine dollars, what is it, you know? Ten, wow, you know, I'll move to, <laughs> I'll move to this area. <laughs> Right. So now what happens is that when you look at that, when he gets that paycheck, he's like, wow, look, I got a paycheck, all of $300, right? I got a paycheck, you know? And so he looks at that $300, and that's a big thing for him. So now you look at that, okay, that's available for you. But listen up, wouldn't it be sweeter if that $300 check was a $3,000 check? What would you choose? Uh, tell me. That's a question. Would you choose the $300 or would you choose the uh, $3,000? Some people are saying, what are you talking about? San Jose? $30,000. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let me raise the stakes then. $30,000, right? You know, what's better? That $300 paycheck or the $30,000 cash out? Uh, there you go, you see? And now you all agree to that, right? That that's better? Okay, now you tell that 16-year-old, 17-year-old that, listen, do you want that? Would he say yes? Does he really want that? You see, he wants it, right? That's a pleasure. The 30,000 is more pleasurable than the 300. It's easy to understand. That's more pleasurable. But this is available for you. That is potentially available for you. But to get that, you need to do a little bit of work. In order to get that, you need to make some sacrifices. Right? You, need, you, you can't be just hanging out with your friends all evening long and expecting that you're going to get a job like that. You need to stay away from, you know, the little fun you're having right now in order to get the bigger fun that's potentially available for you. My friends, this is natural to all of us. All of us are like that. Don't we want something better, something that is potentially ours, but it takes a little bit of sacrifice to get it. Allah is saying that, listen, I divided pleasures into these two. One that I gave to you right now, you can enjoy right now. That's the burgers. And the other one, yes, that. Tell me, what is more interesting for you? What does your nature say? What does your instinct say? What do you want? Now, here is where, if you understand this, that naturally we want that, then why is it? If people understand it, I'm saying everyone, my friends. You see, for example, a child, a child growing up watches sports. Uh, tell me, what is, uh, you know, watching, I don't know, football. You got the Niners here, right? Or the Raiders. I don't know who you vote for. What? Whoever you have here, the Niners or the Raiders, you know, you are a fan of theirs and you watch that. Watching their games is a pleasure. Ask the kid. Do you enjoy watching a football game? Of course he does, you know, I mean, you know, he had plans for it, <laughs> right? So he does enjoy watching the football game, right? He watches the football game. Now ask him, tell me, what would be more pleasurable? Do you think it would be more pleasurable to watch the Niners play or to play 
with the Niners. You see, my friends, every child that's watching a football game has the dream that one day he will wear that jersey and play on that field. You know, that's why after the game he goes outside and starts throwing. You know, and he's dreaming, right? He can feel the fans all around him. Right? You see that? It's natural. That pleasure is more. And to achieve that pleasure, this kid knows that I need to work out, I need to practice, I need to go and play in order I can get better, and maybe I'll have a chance. You see? And everything in life, this is the case. You have certain pleasures that are available. Watching the game on a sofa with chips in your hand and a Coke in the other hand is pleasurable. But it's more pleasurable to actually go out and play. You see, this is my friend, everyone, not just in sports, in education, in everything. There are pleasures that are available for you, there are pleasures that are potentially available for you. Now, if human beings want those greater pleasures, then why do you think that most human beings never try for it? Why don't they try for it? Why, they know that's better. Why aren't they working for it? My friends, this is where we reach a predicament in human beings that is literally laughable. Really, when you look at this, you know, you just laugh. Wow, that's the reason? It's so dumb. I mean, the reason. Why they do not strive for better things in their life. Why don't they strive for that? Why don't they strive for a better job, for better education, for a better life, for a uh, better pleasures? Why don't they strive for that? You know why? La ilaha illallah. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Very simply, my friends, you know why people don't strive for greater pleasures? It's not very complicated. <laughs> They're just lazy. <laughs> you might be saying, yeah, look at it. When you know that that's better, why aren't you striving for it? <laughs> lazy. <laughs> and who's helping you to be lazy? Shaitan. <laughs> He's helping you to sit on that sofa <laughs> and eat more chips. <laughs> right? <laughs> He's uh, helping you there, right? <laughs> Patting you on the back. Hey, you know, relax. You know, you're having fun, right? And we're like, yes, I'm having fun. <laughs> okay, then, relax with me. You know, you don't want to go there and play, you know? <laughs> you see, and so what happened is that it's laziness, my friends. People are just lazy. They do not, they know this is better for them. Why aren't you doing, I'm just lazy. And shaitan helps us on the way. And when he helps us to just be lazy, what do we happen? We destroy our ability and potential for the greater pleasures that Allah has. You know how does shaitan do that? Very simply. He gets you so much involved in the pleasures that are available for you that you forget about the greater pleasures that you can have. Simple as that, my friend. This is it. He just makes you forget that. You know, he says here, you know, I mean, you know, you get up for prayer, he says, you need to eat. I say, yes, because it's a pleasure. Eating is a pleasure. So we get, you know, he gets us to go to the pleasures. Isn't that? There are, for example, you know, we want to go to a majlis. He says, listen, you know, I mean, but there's work tomorrow, paycheck, money. All right. You know, we skip it. And everything. He just comes and tells us, enjoy the pleasures that you have right now to forego the pleasures that can be yours that are better. And we all know it's better. Because we know that these pleasures that are available for us, they come with their uh, side effects. Right? You eat, you know what happens after you eat? Side effect, right? It's natural. You know, side effect. 
stomach ache, acid reflux. <laughs> you know? Then you have to carry around Pepto Bismol, you know, in your pocket, so that whenever you go and eat biryani at Saba Center, you know, <laughs> you know, you the repercussions of that. Yes, there's a pleasure, but these pleasures have their side effects. Oversleeping. Sleeping too much is there. Sleep is a pleasure, but oversleeping, what happens? You know what happens. Everyone has a different reaction, so I'm not going to go into that. All right? Uh, no, for example, you know, whatever pleasure that is available for you, you see those pleasures that are here, we all know that they have side effects. But the pleasures that are there, that, that, that are greater, we don't see any side effects of that. You know why? Because when I saw Imam Ali pray, I did not see him stop. I did not see him come. I saw him just on a constant motion of pleasure. And I'm looking at that and say, wow, I want to feel that pleasure where there is a high but there is no down. Naturally, I want that. And that's where, my friends, we start. After shaitan does that, so first we must be aware of shaitan and say that, listen, I don't want to listen to you. And from here we go forward. I'll say one thing, and inshallah, you know, as I said, I, you know, uh, how do we get there? From these places, that pleasure is something that I'm not going to touch on. I'm not going to touch about on how we get from these places to that pleasure, because that itself is a path that you have to take. But I'm just going to cap off this topic by saying two more things, inshallah, and we will stop here. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. La ilaha illallah. One more salawat. You know, when we look at the words of the Imams, from here we start learning how important this is for us to strive for the greater pleasures. You know, it's not that the Imams were not striving for it. Imams were also striving for those greater pleasures. Sometimes, you know, we Shias have this thing in our mind that the Imams and Ahlul Bayt have reached the ceiling of growth and there's no growth after that. Which is a completely incorrect concept. Right? Just as a... Uh, you can say hadith. Imam Baqir alayhi salam. You know, I said that, you know, um, Allah reveals to us Ahlul Bayt. He reveals to us a knowledge about Himself every Thursday night. Every Thursday night, Allah reveals a knowledge about Himself to us that when we get that knowledge, when we Ahlul Bayt get that knowledge, it's as if we never knew Allah before this. My friends, Allah is infinite. He's infinite. And that's why you see, whenever Ahlul Bayt see the separation between themselves and Allah, they are crying. You see how, you know, when they pray, they see Allah, you are there, let me have more of your blessings. They are praying. They are crying, they are shaking. More than us, because they feel that gap more than we do. And now where are we? <laughs> you know, now imagine where we are, right? You know, completely negligent, you know, <laughs> happy-go-lucky and we are going about our life, you know, <laughs> flipping burgers and making donuts. <laughs> Salawat Muhammad wa alam. You know, some people, when, when we speak about these greater pleasures and these beautiful pleasures, some people look at that and their view about them is that, wow, that's interesting. Interesting? <laughs> what kind of uh, viewpoint is that? Yeah, it's interesting, you know, to, uh, you know, maybe, you know, if we have the chance. If ever I have free time, I'll strive for it. Uh, this is your life. This is your nature. 
the call of your nature to go and reach those pleasures. Why aren't you fulfilling your own self? It's not just interesting, it is my life I'm talking about. Really, we need to get to that. So now, let, when we see this, just one, this dua that Imam Sajjad salam had read. You know, here's Imam Sajjad praying to Allah, and let's see his tone and what he's saying. He says, وَهَبِّبْ إِلَيَّ مَا تُحِبُّ مِنَ الْقَوْلِ وَالْأَمَلِ حَتَّى أَدْخُلَ فِيهِ بِالْلَزَّةٍ He's saying that Allah, whatever you want me to do through saying or actions, whatever you want me to do, make me do it, make me enter it with lazat, with pleasure. Right. You ask me to pray, Allah, let me enter prayer with lazat. Give me that that understanding, that emotion, that thing that comes in there where I can enter it with pleasure. Imam Sajjad, you want to feel pleasure? And pious people become, you know, what are you talking about? That's Imam Sajjad, Sayyidu Sajideen. When you read Dua Abu Hamza, Fumali, you see that the Imam is asking Allah for materialistic pleasures. Allah, I want this in Jannah, I want this in Jannah, I want this in Jannah. And some people, they become so pious that, you know, I said, oh, why do you be, you know, should only ask for Allah? Brother, don't you understand this? The Imam is not asking for the material pleasure. He's asking for these pleasures because they are from Allah. They're through His love. Don't you see that Allah is giving it? You haven't recognized that. You haven't seen that. You're thinking that this is it. If Allah is giving it, and Allah is your goal, and Allah, you are giving it so I can enjoy it. Imam is saying that. So what is the right way of being religious? First of all, don't be more muttaqi than Imam Sajjad. <laughs> right. Don't be too pious, right? People are like, you know, uh, you know Maulana, what are you talking about? Lazat for it. Lazat is what? Lazat ibadat. No, not lazat ibadat, please. Lazat dunya. This lazar, this is where we need to start. The right way of being religious, Allah has given these things so that we enjoy it, so that we partake in it, in order that we get the taste of pleasure, then we can thank Allah for it and start building a relationship with Allah. The wrong way of religion is to stay away from these things to avoid pleasures that Allah has given us as blessings so that we can start complaining and getting frustrated and saying, now Allah, you owe me because I went through frustration because of you. This is the wrong way to stand before Allah. When Imam is asking Allah, you gave me this, thank you for that. You gave me this thing, you gave me this blessing, this blessing. My friends, we are not that big. We are the same child that used to walk with our father holding our finger and we are asking our father, Dad, Dad, I want some candy, I want candy. We are the same child. We, now the only thing is that we have grown up and we have aql. So we should be crying more now to Allah for the candies that He has that He wants to give us. Be that same child, you are that same child. Be humble and have that humility to say that Allah, I am nothing. I am just looking for the candies that you throw at me. That's all I am. I am nothing big. Really, I am nothing big. That's it. Now, one thing I said, that was one thing I told you. Now the second thing I'll tell you, and inshallah we will end it for today and I'll cap it off here. I haven't mentioned, unfortunately, how to get from this stage to the higher pleasures. There's a path that you have to follow and, and inshallah, you know, if you ever have the time, we will go at uh, some people who want to know that, you know, can meet me after the speech and inshallah I will answer their questions. But right now, right, 
how do we enhance this pleasure that we have? How is this pleasure enhanced? Any pleasure, whether it is difficult and hardships, how do we make this better for ourselves? My friends, the height of pleasure comes through love. Love is the secret ingredient that will help you to enjoy the blessings of Allah more. You see, my friends, love does two things. Love does two things. It makes difficult things easy and it makes good things better. Two things that love does, and you'll see that. You know, I'm a lazy person, right? If you ask me to do something, you know, I'm probably not going to do it that well, right? I'll see what I'm getting for it. And then I'll do it. Just being lazy, right? But, if someone that I love, you know, if she tells me to do it, you know what, you know, all that laziness is gone. <laughs> and I run, you know, I'm, I'm talking about my wife, right? If my wife tells me to do something, <laughs> don't get the wrong meaning. Right? If she tells me to do something, I get up right away and I'll do it, you know? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll never hear the end of it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Salamat. <laughs> If someone loves you and they ask you for something, you see that even though it's difficult for you, you'll do it. You do it. It becomes easier for you. Difficult things become easier to love. And good things become better. You know, good things become better. For example, I bought a flower from Walmart. You know, the only relationship I have with that flower is $2.99. You know, that's the only relationship I have with that flower. That's it. Nothing more than that. But let's say if someone that I love gave me that flower. Now that flower is not just money, it's a memory. Right? It's a memory. You know, it's memorable now. You see, good things become better. And that's why, for example, if I tell you all to, uh, to go outside in the parking lot and kiss a, so a, a stone... You know, the stone outside there, right? Kiss the stone. You know, like, oh, I'm kissing stone, this and that. You know, that is like unheard of. Why would you do that for this craziness, right? If I start to kiss the stone over here, you'll say, what's wrong with this Molana? You know? That's what will happen. But my friends, tell me, what's making you kiss the turba of Imam Hussain? And no one says anything about it. In fact, you love doing it. You kiss it and you get a pleasure out of it. My friends, this pleasure is because of love. This is the effect of love that love has on a person. Love enhances pleasure. How can I enhance my pleasure in life? My friends, that is through love. Understand what love is. Think about it. Concentrate on it. Contemplate on it. Fall in love. Right? We are told to fall in love with Ahlul Bayt. That's a difficult thing, right? But still, you know, try it. And you'll see that life becomes better when a person is in love. Allah kept that as an ingredient by which the, the blessings that He has given us can be more pleasurable. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. La ilaha illallah. So this hadith al Qudsi that came about where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He says that uh, Allah is saying love is divided into 100 parts. Love is divided into 100 parts. Love, all of it is divided into 100 parts. Allah says, I kept 99 for myself and I gave one to the whole universe. I gave 99 for myself and I kept one for the whole universe. And then that one that's in the whole universe, the love that is shared between all of us and the whole universe, that one part that's there, he says, I divided that into a hundred parts and 99 parts I gave to Ahlul Bayt and one part for the rest of the world. No, so what does that mean? 
You know, what does that mean now? You see, this is where we need to start thinking. Think about it. How does it apply to me? You know, it means that I love. I have the ability to love. I love. But Ahlul Bayt love more. I love Hussein, but Hussein loves me more. See that. And the difference between his love and my love is dividing 100 into 99 and 1. And that is just a comparison that Allah gave. It's much more than that. It's much more than that. The disparity is much more than that, my friends. You know, and that's where we come to everything in love and we see that. This is where it becomes. I wish I had, could explain this more, but I'm going to really stop here. Right? My friends, if I cry for Imam Hussain, if I cry for Bibi Fatima, right? I want you to at that time think that if I'm crying this much for Imam Hussain, then Imam, how much is Imam Hussain crying for me? What's more? What's more important? See, that's how we need to start thinking between our relationship and my Imam. Imam, if I'm crying for you, I cannot imagine how much you have cried for me. If I love you, I can't even imagine how much you have loved me. Friends, love is such. I mean, the imam, love that Imam Hussein had was such that really it made everyone obligated to Imam Hussein. Sometimes, you know, when I go for ziyarat and the group that goes with me, you know, people, for example, you know, they think that, you know, when we go to Karbala, we're going to cry a lot, we're going to do a lot of matam, and which happens, right? We go there, we cry, we do matam, we do zadari, and all of these things, and that is due in Karbala uh, at the shrine of Imam Hussain. But after they cry and all that, they come back and they feel good. They feel good. They feel like satisfied, gratified. They feel like pleasure. They feel a pleasure there. And they come to me and say, Maulana, I mean, I don't know if this is right. I, don't, I, I feel guilty that I went and I cried for Imam Hussain. And after that, I feel a sense of pleasure. A sense of pleasure. And they feel guilty about that. And I tell them, don't feel guilty about that. You see, don't you feel guilty about that. Everyone who goes to Hussain are going to come out gratified. Everyone who has gone to Hussain, you see everyone who has gone to Hussain has come back with a sense of pleasure. Really that's the case. Sometimes we need to look about that. You know that, that, that story about the angel who, uh, you know, who was like handicapped, you know. You all remember that story, you know, where he came there? The, you know, the angel who was like injured and, you know, and Imam Hussain was born. And all the angels were going there. Right, and this angel was brought there, and he, you know, they said, if you want your wings back, then you need to go to Imam Hussain and uh, go to him. You know, he went there, and his wings were given back to him. Right, that's symbolic of, you know, when you go to Hussain, everything that you have, that pleasure, whatever pleasure you'll be looking for, will be attained there with Hussain. My friends, everyone who has gone to Hussein, and you will see this yourself if you go to Karbala, and inshallah may Allah make you go to Karbala. When you go to Imam Hussein and the shrine of Imam Hussein, you will see that, that there is a sense of gratification, a sense of pleasure that you will feel after you cried for Imam Hussein. After you mourned for Imam Hussein. Everyone who has gone to Imam Hussein, felt a sense of pleasure and gratification except except for Zainab Kubra even after Zainab went her heart was still burning <laughs> even after she went it was still burning you know and this story of this brother and sister has been told many times. And since the, we are trying to remember a sister of the brothers who are here who passed away, just to give a relationship between a sister, I want to 
tell another story of another brother and sister in Karbala. And this story, I mean, you know, yes, Hussein and Zainab, it is heartrending. But when you look at this brother and sister, this story really moves you. It's a story of two brothers and sisters that is really untold, not really spoken of. You know, the brother was Imam Sajjad and the sister was Sakina. <laughs> you know, both these, both these brothers and sisters, this brother and sister, right, you know, had such a relationship from Karbala onwards. Really, all of their family is finished. They have themselves just to hold on to, but they cannot hold on to themselves because, you know, when Imam Sajjad was taken, first of all, his bed was pulled from under him. The bed was pulled from under him, and Imam fell on the ground. <laughs> he wasn't able to get back up because he was so, he was so tired, he was so exhausted from the sickness that he was in, he wasn't able to get up. And that Imam Sajjad, as he was taken, when they came there, they wanted to kill him. If it wasn't for Bibi Zainab coming in the way, they would have killed him. But when they let go of him, they said, okay, we will decide how he is taken. So they decided not to kill him. But you know what? They didn't treat him any better. <laughs> they didn't treat him any better. You know how they took him? They, when they pulled him up, he wasn't able to stand up. The first thing they did is that they put chains on his feet. <laughs> they put chains on his feet. <laughs> to let him know that now he has become a prisoner. <laughs> He's not free anymore. He's a prisoner now. Then they, then they cuffed his hands. They cuffed his hands. And then when they cuffed his hands, now that's another thing. And then after that, they, then they put a brace on his neck, a neck brace made of wood. They put it on his neck, and then they would make him walk. Now Imam Sajjad can't even stand up, and they're trying to make him walk. He can't even stand up. And they're trying to make him walk. So when he walks, now at first what happened is that that neck brace was falling down. And they would put it back up again. It was falling down. So then they said, is there any way that we can put this on that it doesn't fall off? And then they came up with the idea, let's drive in nails. My friends, nails were driven in that, that neck brace that went into the flesh of Imam Sajjad. <laughs> Imam Sajjad was like, you know, even after Karbala, when he came back and met Muhammad Hanafiya and Muhammad Hanafiya, his uncle, when he braced him, Imam Sajjad cried in pain. Even Muhammad Hanafiya asked him, after all this time, he asked him, what's wrong? He said, the neck brace. <laughs> You know, Imam Sajjad, now after they put that on, now he's bleeding. Now he's bleeding. Now they make him walk again. But how far can a, a, a person who's that sick walk? He will take a few steps. No, he won't even take a few steps. He will stumble a few steps. And then he will fall down to the ground. He will fall down to the ground. Then you know what they would do? They would then put, put, put thorns in the way. So that he walks on those thorns. And then he would walk on those thorns and he, and he would wince in pain. He would wince in pain as he's walking. Now my friends, understand the situation. Understand the situation. At that moment, as Imam Sajjad was walking that way, and they were making him walk, whenever he used to fall down, and they would tell him, get up. And Imam Sajjad obviously would muster up his energy to get up. And then as he would walk a few more steps, he would fall down again. So then they would say that, okay, we don't have time for this. They would come, they would take a whip, and they would start hitting him until he gets up. <laughs> they would take a whip, and they would, hit, they would beat him until he gets up. Imam Sajjad is struggling to get up. 
in the barrage of the strikes of the whips. Imam Sajjad is struggling to get up. Now in that way, my friend, in that way, you know, at that moment, from there we see the relationship of Imam Sajjad and Sakina began. You know, here's what it happened. Sakina, she was traumatized by Imam Hussain to such an extent that the ladies were concerned about Sakina. You know why? Because as I said, hidden emotions that don't come out, you know, people get upset. If a child doesn't cry, they get... They, they are more concerned about what will happen to them. Sakina stopped crying. Sakina stopped crying. She was just staring now into empty space. Ladies were afraid. Sakina, please cry Sakina. Say something Sakina. But you know what? When Sakina started to cry again, when she saw Imam Sajjad in pain. Whenever they used to beat Imam Sajjad up, Sakina would look at him and tears would roll down. Tears would roll down her cheeks. Every time Sakina was looking at him and every time they beat him, their tears will roll down. And Imam Sajjad will, will just pass looks on Sakina, will glance towards Sakina and he would say, Sakina, you need me more than I need you, Sakina. So, Imam Sajjad is looking at her and this relationship that there is no talk in between just glances at each other Imam Sajjad did not want to speak with Sakina Imam knows what's happening Imam Sajjad doesn't want to speak with Sakina you know why? because I'll tell you now and then you can pay your condolences give <laughs> your condolences Imam Sajjad is is stealing glances at Sakina, calming him, her down with his eyes. Sakina is always looking at Imam Sajjad. Every time they beat him up, as he's not getting up, they would go... Sakina would look at him and cry. As that was happening, Shimr came in this process. Shimr came in this process and one time Imam Sajjad fell down and he wasn't getting up. He wasn't, no matter how much they struck him, he wasn't able to get up. He had fallen down, his energy is finished. Everything is done, he's down and they're just striking him and striking him. And Shimr comes and says, what's happening? He's not getting up. He's not getting up. Shimmer looks and says, hit him more. He's not getting up. Shimmer then you know, looks around and sees. And then he recognizes that Sakina is crying as Imam Sajjad is being beaten up. <laughs> Shimmer then asks, who is this girl? Who is this girl? Someone says, this is the daughter of Hussain. <laughs> My friends, that was the worst thing that could have happened. That Shimmer heard that Sakina is the sister of Imam Sajjad. You know why? Shimmer then said, now I know how to make him get up and walk. <laughs> now when Imam Sajjad fell down, next time he says, let me go. He went to Sakina. And he said, if you don't get up, then here's what I'll do. He started striking Sakina. Imam Sajjad, in his hopelessness, mustered up all his power, stood up and said, no. <laughs> you know how this relationship started? This is where it starts. This is where it starts. And you know how this relationship went on all the way to Sham. I will not go all the way. But let me mention one more riwayat for you. And then inshallah you give your condolences. One, you know they used to take this caravan and they used to stop at night. When they used to stop at night, they will huddle the ladies together on one side. They would put Imam in one other place with his hands tied behind his back to a spear that either was in the ground or a pole that's over there or a wall. They will attack him to that so he doesn't move anywhere so Imam Sajjad his hands are tied behind his back he wasn't able to move and then the ladies would be on the other side all day long Imam Sajjad had walked the ground gone over thorns was bleeding from his feet and everything Sakina at that point she would wait for everyone to go to sleep the camp went to sleep the ladies would go to sleep after that Sakina would now slowly she would get up open her eyes open her eyes she will crawl her way on her knees 
she will start crawling on her knees so that no one sees her, no one listens to her, and she will make her way to Imam Sajjad. <laughs> Imam Sajjad. And then she will take the feet of Imam Sajjad. She will put their feet on her lap and start crying over them and wash his feet with her tears. And one by one she will pull out the thorns from his feet. Imam Sajjad, with his hair tied behind his back, will be looking at his sister with so much love. Sakina, I wish I could embrace you. Sakina, I wish I could comfort you. One time Sakina started crying out loud. As she started crying out loud, the soldiers noticed that. Someone came there and saw what Sakina was doing. They came with a whip and started to beat Sakina. Imam Sajjad cried out, Don't beat my Don't beat my sister! Beat me instead! <laughs> سيعلم الذين ظلموا اي منقلب ينقلبون يا محمود بحق محمد يا علاء بحق علي يا فاطر السماوات بحق فاطمة يا محسن بحق حسن يا قديم الحسان بحق حسين Allah give us a tawfiq to be on the right path the wisdom to understand your guidance hasten the reappearance of our imam make us his helper when he comes increase the love of ahlul bayt in our hearts and the hearts of our children make our feet firm on the path of ahlul bayt give us strength in our hands so that we can hold up the flag of islam wa akhir da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alamin matam husain Zainab run to him Zainab run to him Zainab run to him See him one last time Zainab run to him Zainab run to him Zainab run to him See him one last time Zainab run to him Zainab run to him Zainab run to him See him one last time Zainab run to him Zainab run to him Zainab run to him See him one last time What a wondrous scene A flower in the plain My wounded Lord Hussein Lying there to die What a wondrous scene A flower in the plain My wounded Lord Hussein Lying there to die Nothing does he see But his grandfather His heavenly mother Come here to our side Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, see him one last time. Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, see him one last time. The blood upon his face, the blood upon his neck, all still better than what will happen next. 
the blood upon his face, the blood upon his neck, all still better than what will happen next. Soldiers crowding round, pointing to his throat, the imam of his time, he lies upon the ground. Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him. Zainab run to him, see him one last time. Zainab run to him, Zainab, Zainab, see him one last time. The dust upon your eyes, the feeling in your throat, the desperate children's cries, the screaming of women. The dust upon your eyes, the feeling in your throat. The desperate children's cries, the screaming of women. But all within your mind is calling for Hussein. Your brother is in pain, and you must fly to him. Zainab, run to him. Zainab, run to him. Zainab, run to him. See him one last time. Zainab, run to him. Zainab, son. Zainab, run to him. One last time, Sakina at your feet, you look into her eyes, does she realize what will now occur? Sakina at your feet, you look into her eyes, does she realize what will now occur? The greatest of mankind will meet the cruelest end, along with his loyal friends, and who will now guard her? Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him, see him one last time, Zainab run to him, run to him, Zainab see him one last time, like a lioness, worries for its young, you gaze from on a hill, your body's cold with stress, like a lioness, worries for its young, you gaze from on a hill, your body's cold with stress. That body is it his, that screaming is it yours. You see his arms and chest, not moving anymore. Two orphans on a plane, God knows how hard they are. Just say nothing, Hussein, so close but still so far. Say no, run to him, say no, run to him. Zainab run to him, see him one last time. Zainab run to him, Zainab run to him. Zainab run to him, see him one last time. Yao Sen, Yao Sen, Yao Sen, Yao Sen, मैं सदा देती रही तू ना जब दासर से चिनी मैं सदा देती रही तू ना बहन खैद हुई तू नाया से से मैं सदा देती रही तू नाया से से मैं सदा देती रही हमको पानी ना मिले तेरी खुशबू तो रहे तेरे बाजू ना कटे चाहे मशकी जाच दे ये मगर हो ना सका तेरे बाजू है जुदा मुझ पे है तश ना लबी तू ना आया काजी 
हरिदास सचिनी मैं सदा देती रही धूप में तू था सजे तुझसे आबाद था घे सर बरना मेरा से क्या नहीं तुझ को खबे अरे अलमदार वफा इस बहन को बखुदा तुझसे डरस्ती बड़ी तू नाया दास सचनी सदा दे जबरदास सचनी सदा दे आ गई शाम अलम टूट गए अहले हरम रेत पर जल की हुई हो गया ठंडालम फुर्सा देने के लिए मुझसे मिलने के लिए आ गए बाबाली तू नाजी जबरदास सचनी मैं सदा दे तू नाजी जबरदास सचनी मैं सदा दे क्या कहूँ से मेरे तेरी हम बोलिए ये मुसलमान सारे शहर दर शहर गए खत को फा कभी खत शाम कभी बारवा हम पे हसी तू नाजी जबरदास सचनी मैं सदा दे अली सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा हमारे पुरुषे के लिए फात मजरा सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात हमारे पुरुषे के लिए से सकीना के उतारे गए गो है कानो से सकीना के उतारे गए गो है जैनब की भी चीनी है रिदा फात मजरा सलाह तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा सलाह तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा हमारे पुरुषे के लिए हाँ बेड़ी पिना दौड़ी बदन जख्मी कर दिया बेड़ी पिना दौड़ी बदन जख्मी कर दिया सजा पर जुल्म किया फात मजरा सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा सलवा तो सलामा पे आफात मजरा हमारे पुरुषे के लिए फात मजरा Uh, brothers and sisters, we have a Q and A session right after Salam in the English Hall for both brothers and sisters. Uh, both Maulana Muhammad Beg and Amin Rastani, Maulana Amin Rastani will be present. Also, we have uh, received a uh, lost car keys. If uh, anybody, the owner, can come up to the uh, member and get it for me, please. Thank you. السلام عليك يا رسول الله يا حبيب الله يا خير خلق الله ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله السلام عليك يا ابن رسول الله يا حسين أيها الشهيد بكربلا السلام عليك وعلى جدك وأبيك وعلى أمك وأخيك جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا صاحب الأسر والزمان السلام عليك يا إمام النبي إمام إنسان الجان عجل الله تعالى فرجك وسهل الله تعالى مخرجك وذهورك السلام عليكم جميع المسلمين ورحمة الله وبركاته اللهم صل على Brothers and sisters, there's a request for Surah Fatiha again for Sayyida Sughra bint Ghazamfar Ali Khan and Iftikhar Ali Khan ibn Safdar Ali Khan, Surah Al-Fatiha.
Brothers and sisters, uh, as you are aware, Sabah is arranging uh, for a Zarat group to go to Iran and Iraq. We still have four to five spots available. If someone is interested, uh, we request you to contact us as soon as possible. Uh, tomorrow is the last day to sign up for this Zarat. So we have the information on the website the phone numbers and the contact information. If anyone is interested, or if you know of anyone, your friends or family, please have us approach, have them approach us as soon as possible. Thank you.